I'm Heather Mears and I have been in Walla Walla for just over a year now and the entire time that I have been here I keep hearing these wonderful stories about a man named Ernie and I have been dying to meet him because he's a wonderful writer and I am a writer and he's an amazing gardener and I am also a fellow gardener and today I finally have the opportunity to meet Ernie and we are here just to chat. I just want him to talk about what makes him happy, the things he loves to do, and why he loves to do them, and anything else he wants to say. This is the Ernie show today. So, Ernie, go ahead and introduce yourself and say whatever you would like to say. Well, this is Ernest Jones, and I do like to garden. I also like to surprise people with plants that they don't think grows, grow here. I've grown some large yams. My favorite are peanuts. And that's a novelty. Uh, gardening I like. I grew up having to garden, weeding and hoe, but still with that, I, I, I have a need to garden. That gets me outside, gets me in the soil. Mm -hmm. And, oh yes, the weeds are always there, and they grow faster than anything, but I'll keep at them. I have been in the Walla Walla area for 30 plus years. I've been gardening for many decades longer than that. And growing a lot of, I, this spring we had a lot of daffodils, different varieties, and Crown Imperial, which really, I'm told, beautified the yard. Or not what now? Um, What's your favorite thing to grow? Well, it was grow large winter squash. Oh. I had some huge ones, but well, they worked out good. They were big, and they were tasted good. But to try to find someone that could help me eat them. Yeah. Was harder. That's the thing about squash when you grow zucchinis and squash, you get like way more than you think you're gonna get. And then what do you do with all of it? Right. <laughs> and I like growing my peanuts. Yeah, that's and pretty exotic. I didn't know those would grow here. Most people don't know they'd grow here. Are they do they grow on a bush or, or underground or both. Uh-huh. Uh, they are a bush, not a large bush, but I mean, in this um, plant would be a foot or more high, maybe that wide. They send out, they, well they bloom, and from the bloom they send out a feeler. That feeler goes into the soil and that is what the the peanut itself grows on. Wow. And so you, you have the plant, but you need the feeler and, and to get the peanuts down there. Uh-huh. Pollination, I'm not sure. I think they're pretty much self-pollinated by the insects and bees and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, I've grown uh, quite a few well, okay, so it's a novelty, um, but it's still, it's still fun harvesting them and letting them dry, then fixing them. Uh -huh. I understand you cannot grow them for sale in this in the state. Interesting. But uh, as a hobby, at least no one's told me I couldn't grow them as a hobby. <laughs> and I'm not selling them, so... Yeah, I don't think they dare tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
No, it's interesting that you mentioned how you like to get your hands in the dirt because I'm the same way. Even <coughs> like on a day that I have had just a horrible day, that makes it better. Just need to go out, dig in the dirt for a while, you know, listen to the bees. Just it, makes it all better. It really does. Uh -huh. And for years I've grown up with the honeybees or you want to throw in the hornets. Uh -huh. um, I have no, uh, what, what's the word? The hornets or yellow jackets, I don't like at all. Yeah, I don't either. The but bees are the, great though. The honeybees, yeah. I can be weeding around them. I can pull up weeds, uh -huh. I can bump them, and they don't bother me. Yeah, I think they know. I have to tell you, that's so interesting that you say that because before I lived here, I um, actually had a small lavender farm in Arvada, Colorado, mm -hmm. and I grew over 12 different varieties of lavender, oh. and I was out there all the time, you know, working and, and harvesting, and it, not being able to see what you're grabbing, you would think, you know, I had hundreds of, of bees and butterflies and d different kinds of bees. I mean, so many different kinds. And I was just waiting for the day when I would accidentally grab one, uh -huh. you know, but I never did. And it's just like you just said, I think they just felt the, the calm and they knew where I was and I knew where they were. And one day I actually um, grabbed one of the stems to cut. And that whole plant was vibrating because of those bees. And it just made me think, wow, that is the power of life right there. You know, just yeah. those bees making that plant vibrate. And it was just amazing, you know. I had, I had them buzzing all around me. And I think, I'm not positive on this, I think the honeybees, if they do sting, they will die before long and mm -hmm. they can only sting one time. Mm -hmm. The hornets and yellow jackets, they just keep on stinging. Yeah. And they also, I think they know me when I'm coming and they're just ready to get at me. Yeah. Just because they're the hornet. Or uh, yeah, we don't, we don't care for those. <laughs> but I have no problem working and letting the honeybees buzz around me. Yeah, definitely. You just have to coexist. So I heard something about you planting a garden in a refrigerator. Did that happen? Did I hear that I, right? I have uh, <laughs> the uh, inside, well, the refrigerator container, all the old parts uh -huh. were taken out. Yeah. And setting that on, on railroad ties, actually that's my favorite because mm -hmm. It's almost waist high. You don't have to bend over so far. Uh, gophers cannot get in it. Right. And I can grow about anything in there. Uh huh. And it's just easy. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, I kind of have a. Um, I love antiques, and I kind of have a thing for old those old washing machines. Oh yeah. And I think those would make a really cool garden too. <laughs> I I've of, got the. I would like to do that someday. <laughs> I've got the inside uh, circular part of an old machine. Yeah. That's one of my. Well, it's not really a tub, but it's one of my. Well, large flower pots, I guess. Uh huh. Say. See. That yeah. works pretty good. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering uh, if you could tell a little bit about your life, where you were born. Uh, are you interested in that, Heather? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. <coughs> um, and uh, what you did in life uh, before you became blind and how that happened. Um, early as a child, I had thick glasses. I started in the first grade wearing thick glasses. I say thick. The outer part of the glass was thick, the inner part was thin. And Actually, the outer part had to be filed so it wouldn't rub my, my face. Oh. And that gave me boggle eyes or something. I, to me, I looked ugly. But I can, I can say that all my years wearing those, no one teased me. Mm -hmm. And that was really good. 
Uh, I wore glasses at around age 16, just having a routine eye checkup. The doctor found I had a retina tear, tear, but it had scarred, so it was more or less healed. At age 21, I got my first contacts. And for anyone today, they were not like the, the today's contacts. They were thicker. I shed many a tear while I tried to wear them. Mm -hmm. But once, um, once they were smooth, filed smooth, so I could wear them, it opened up the world. Uh, I could see much clearer. Objects were bright; they were brighter and clearer. And the more correct vision eyesight even extended my my own eyesight longer. I was able to see and and uh, my eyesight was fine for another 20 years. Wow. Um, I've got, there's a long name, I just I just put it under ret retina degeneration mm -hmm. because of the severe nearsightedness. And I was working, well I graduated as an RN, working in the hospital. And I loved the work, I really liked it. And <clears throat> I was concerned about my eyes. It's just a couple things happened. <clears throat> I wasn't getting the uh, treatment. I wasn't, the doctor wasn't. So I found another doctor who came there into our vicinity, which was Colville, Washington, a <clears throat> uh, couple of days a month. And I liked him, and he did a check and says, I advise you not to drive your car anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to see you in my office Monday. That's two to three. Um, this was, fr fr uh, yeah, it's Friday. He wanted to see me Monday. And I didn't think too much. I went and had my eye checkup, and he said, no more driving, no more running equipment, you're, you're blind, you're legally blind. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, well, I can see, I can see sharp. <laughs> I'm the one that they, they often call to read the doctor's handwriting. Yeah. I can see the vial of medicine, I can see it sharp. He says, yes, but that's, you're looking at that. What happens when you something's out of your eyesight? Mm -hmm. And then I, I knew because right in my eyesight it's sharp, but looking at that, uh, just a few degrees mm -hmm. either way, I saw nothing. Yeah, that is. Uh, I think that's a hard concept to come to terms with when you think you can uh, see but you can't see as well as you need to to do those, you know, functions like driving. Um, the hard part was to be a, a re registered nurse, mm -hmm. enjoy, enjoy the work, and know I was needed as a nurse one day, and the next day it was over. Mm -hmm. And that, that hit hard, that really hit hard. Because I like the nursing. Mm -hmm. So how did you get through that? Because I'm difficult. There was tears and yelling and <laughs> mm -hmm. and many walks. Yes. We lived out of Colville, but on a gravel road, and I had ended up walking until I was so tired that I had to sit and rest, and then I could sort of think and listen around me. And I'd go straight, I would gain strength from those walks. 
with the uh, faith that I can, I'll do it, I'll master it, I'll make it. Mm -hmm. and, and see, the last I used my chains, have been, it's been a few years, but I mowed the lawn until it was in 94, and a friend came by and says, well, I know who mowed today. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided I'd better put that up. Yeah. I used the rotor, I mean, yeah, the, the rotor tube for another, oh, five or ten years mm. by changing the way I did it. I used a white board, to, uh, I could see it for one one time around, yeah. then I'd have to move the board. And mm. like I said, taking walks. Oh yes, I had the loon to use the cane. Yep. <laughs> and to me that was the that identified me as a blind person. Mhm. Mm and to me I didn't like it. I think a lot of people have that, you know, same adjustment. It's like as long as you can go without it, you know, you still mm -hmm. feel like you're <clears throat> you're not, but I pushed it off for a long time and um uh, I wasn't injured, and it wasn't a, a close call in my mind. I had crossed the two-lane road, mm -hmm. and two people on bicycles whizzed past me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in danger, and they had seen me. It was no problem. But I had not seen them. Right. <clears throat> I remember that day, or the next day, mm -hmm. calling up the one who I'd been talking to about um, getting mobility training. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and then once you do that, don't you feel like you just start, like, a whole new world opens up that to whole, you? It's yes. It's all, all new. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had the the cane, and I had it mastered this particular day I was put speed into my walk. Mm -hmm. I was timing myself, and I, I, could, I could sense the turns, intersections I had, and I knew I was on the last stretch, so I put more oomph into my walk as to beat my, beat my time. Yeah. And my head crashed into a windshield of a car. Oh. And I thought, why? Mm -hmm. Why didn't my cane warn me? Yeah. Well, to start with, the car was parked almost entirely on the road, paved road. And I think someone did see it because the car was parked off the road more after that. Yeah. But <laughs> I think, you know what, I think we've all had that, like, first, I had my first head injury a few weeks ago, <laughs> walking with uh, Jolene and her dog. I was walking behind <laughs> them, and she was going really fast, mm -hmm. and I was kind of trailing behind, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I met my head with a street sign that was, I think, <clears throat> kind of sticking out a little yeah. bit into the sidewalk. And I'm like, okay, I've got my first battle scar from cane travel. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I questioned uh, a short while later when I was starting to get training for a guide dog. Mm -hmm. I questioned the guide dog trainer. I says, why did I hit that? Yeah. And he says, your stride was just fast enough that you missed the vehicle you, and your leg went in under the mm -hmm. it was the vehicle was raised up away mm. and i went under and he, then he says a guide dog would have prevented that he's giving me a little yeah a little boost yeah uh, so so Tell me about your writing and how you got started with it and, you know, where that's taken you. I got started years ago just just for something to write about and started mm -hmm. writing little poems and stuff. 
but I really got into it in about the uh, middle 1900. And in writing something that the, I, I, I belonged to a writer's group, something that they would like. And also they, they'd cr critique me and critique mm -hmm. my writing. And that's about the way I went. I just increased in my writing, but I did find out uh, a few years later, I went back looking over some of my early, and I thought, wow, they sure needed critique. They sure needed <laughs> some correction. Yeah. But I've gone, I've gone a lot into um, a lot of and ways that I, it, the writing can help a person. Um, maybe they knew it being blind or legally blind, whichever, and the writing would encourage them to help them. Mm -hmm. And that's been my main point is to either to encourage them or to let people, others, know that blind people can do a lot of work. I yes. mean, they don't have to just sit on the couch. Right. I had a lot of people, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'd be on the roof. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're like, why not? <laughs> trimming trees. Trimming trees. You yep. can't do that. Yep. And yes, sometimes I would be pushing the limit. But that was just, that was life. Yeah, wouldn't you rather though push the limit yes. than not do anything? I mean, yeah, but by far. Yeah, by far that they. Um, right now the garden isn't too much, but it took work getting it ready, and good exercise, and it's a good feeling to actually do something. Mm-hmm keeps you going. Oh yes. I had a rough time this last winter and working out in the yard was a healing process. Mm -hmm. That's that garbage truck. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh well. <coughs> well I guess the last question that I would ask you and I mean you can take this in any direction but if you were to put out one message to the world what would it be that would be that when anything happens to you whether it's another disability or in my case I know I'm blindness you don't give up you, you keep going um, even though you have people telling you you can't do that, uh, you, you keep going. Um, to sit, to just get back and sit and not do anything. And this is not, I like gardening, but someone else might want something mm -hmm. else. There's a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And to just do nothing. Um, well, pretty soon you can't do anything. Your body just is sort of... The more you can push yourself, the better life is. Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful. I agree totally. So, is there anything else that you would like to say or...? Just mainly, blindness is not the end. And, and I could say deaf and so forth, but I'm familiar with mm -hmm. blindness. It's not the end. Mm -hmm. You may not like it, but you can work with it and do mm -hmm. a lot with it. You know, I have actually found that blindness has been a beginning for mm -hmm. me, like to a whole new, you know, world of opportunities. So yes. I think, you know, I would definitely agree with you on that. 
Yeah, the, to give up just that's just not good. Mm -hmm. And so you tackle something new. Good. Mm -hmm. You might get hurt. Okay. Oh well. <laughs> so you just playing in the school, you'll get hurt. <laughs> but you're learning. Yep. Well, Ernie, I just want to tell you thank you so much for letting us come and talk with you and you know meet you and hear the wonderful uh, things that you have to share and I just wish you the best thank you give me your hand <laughs> thank you <laughs>